Hello, everyone, and welcome to the International Biochar Initiative webinar, Biochar Use in Asphalt. My name is Caroline Pete, and I will be facilitating this webinar. Before we get started, just a bit of housekeeping. You should already be able to hear me and see the share screen. If you're hearing echoes or your sound quality is bad, you can use the audio functions in the GoToWebinar toolbar, which is probably on the right side of your screen. If you still have any trouble, send the organizers a message using the chat feature. And don't worry, we are recording this webinar. The recording will be available soon after the live event, usually no later than tomorrow. If you have a question, you can ask questions at any time using that questions pod that's in that GoToWebinar toolbar. We will handle all questions at the end of the presentation uh, all together. So I want to thank you again for joining us, and I'm going to hand it off to our moderator, Kathleen Draper, to lead you through the great presentation we have for you today. Kathleen, please take it away. Thanks, Caroline. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us today for what I believe may be a game-changing perspective on emerging markets for biochar. The global pandemic has shown us many things in a very short period of time. Some of it's good, but a lot of it's not so good. One thing we have witnessed is how quickly the world can change when suitably motivated. This gives me hope that when the world wakes up to the looming climate challenge, that we can pivot away from our copious use of paleocarbon to a more intentional use of photosynthetic carbon. Disrupting the carbon cycle by way of carbonization of biomass and sequestration of the resulting biochar into safe and beneficial harbors beyond agricultural use in soils is still in its infancy. Today, you'll learn more about an opportunity which I hope we can pivot towards quickly around the globe. Before we dive into our webinar topic, I always like to say a few words about the International Biochar Initiative for those of you that may not be too familiar with us. We are a membership-driven nonprofit which hit a few exciting milestones recently. I'm very proud to say that IBI now has more than 500 members, which I believe is the first time we've hit that. We also have more than 12,000 subscribers to our monthly newsletter. Suffice to say, the interest in biochar has been growing rapidly over the past year, and we hope IBI can continue to play a key role in helping to build a robust, sustainable biochar industry. We see our role as connecting relevant stakeholders, which includes researchers, biochar entrepreneurs, biomass generators or handlers, policymakers, potential customers, and the investment community. We are focused on promoting good industry practices and environmental and ethical standards, which support rapid scaling of biochar systems that are safe and economically viable. Through webinars, webinars monthly biochar bibliographies, and news newsletters, we aim to keep our members up to date on the latest happenings and greatest opportunities within the industry. Something new we're hoping to launch over the summer for our members is a podcast or podcast-like series of interviews focusing specifically on biochar production technologies. Each separate podcast will highlight a different biochar production technology. We'll be focusing first on those manufactured by our growing number of business members. As with any nonprofit, our aspirations nearly always exceed our budget, but we're really lucky to have a core group of dedicated and helpful volunteers that have been instrumental in helping IBI to keep moving things forward. If you'd like to volunteer some of your time and talents, just let us know. Next slide. I also just want to give a quick shout out to those recently new or renewed business members as these folks provide some much needed financial support to IBI. Next slide. Today's webinar topic has caused quite a stir since it was announced just a few short weeks ago. We had a record number of registrations for this webinar. 164, when last I heard, from 28 different countries. I confess this topic is one that has me really, really excited about a vast new opportunity for what I call sequestration with benefits. I use that term to differentiate biochar from some of the other sequestration options, which do not provide any additional benefits beyond sequestration. As some of you may know, my co-author Albert Bates and I described the use of biochar and asphalt in our book, Burn, which was published last year. And we noted that it could potentially provide as large a sequestration opportunity as the use of biochar in agricultural soils can provide. But to be completely honest, we were speculating on the size of the sequestration opportunity based on scientific literature, not on current commercialized use. At the time we were writing, 
we weren't aware that anyone was including biochar and asphalt beyond laboratory settings, though we knew that there was a lot of interest in doing so. Finding out that a company had already been commercializing the use of biochar and asphalt and had been successfully able to put even more biochar than we'd imagined is probably one of the highlights of 2020 for me. And maybe for some of you, once you hear what Andre Von Ziel has been up to. Not only have we been using it in the asphalt itself, but it can also be used as part of soil stabilization regimes. With the market value of more than 20 billion, the soil, stable, soil stabilization materials industry opens up even more potential for carbon sequestration with benefits. Andre hails from South Africa, but is speaking to us today from Perth, Australia, where it's already past 9 p.m. I believe Andre was stranded there when the pandemic struck, but he's certainly been making the most of his time there as I will let him explain. So with that, Andre, it's over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Kathleen and Caroline for setting up everything. Um, uh, hello to the, to the people online. Uh, please excuse, this is my first webinar um, and it is nine o'clock already, but uh, we're gonna give it the best shot. Um, I'm gonna try and slow it down because we get quite excited about what we've achieved in the last two years, two, two and a half years on the biochar side of things. Uh, quick uh, explanation of the parties involved in our organization. Um, uh, NPS is a, is a, a very new uh, incorporated company, New World Pavement Solutions, which is basically uh, doing all the research and development. We've put two R&D laboratories up here in uh, in Perth. Um, we we do have small laboratories with all our production plants, which is mainly in the first and the third world countries. Uh, Australia is our first first world country that we tackled uh, since early 2018, and it's an eye opener. The other parties involved, Carbon Core. Um, I'm also a director and shareholder on Carbon Core. Uh, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a technology that developed in South Africa and uh, manufacture an anionic, high pH anionic based emulsion that uh, is obviously stable for, for six months plus. And it was developed to be able to build roads in the middle of the bush in Africa and they needed to be environmentally friendly and they needed to be the same or better standard as the, as the hot premix uh, developments. Um, we supply this coal premix extensively. Later on in the slides, there's more information and photos and, and technical info. Um, the other parties involved, Liquid Labs, Western Australia, they've been instrumental in the initial work to develop testing regimes and certification based uh, guidelines for this new type of uh, uh, wedding course material. Talos Consulting, Colin Leake, I think he's also online tonight. Um, he's the old guru, everybody in Australia basically knows him and anything where soil stabilization is involved, he knows what he's doing. Um, we have also involved the University of Western Australia. I think Professor Chow is also online and some of his students. Um, they give us a lot of support um, with the uh, application and test work. And I know some of the students is also busy with master's degree in the use of biochar in asphalt applications. Then main roads, Western Australia, um, one of the one of the, the best uh, uh, government-based road industry here that makes sure that we uh, have good surfaces to travel on. Um, the single biggest goal for us is let's go carbon negative and let's do it together. Um, if you, if you uh, take your, your foot off the accelerator, uh, the the truck just keeps on going at the same speed or starts slowing down too slow. Um, somebody must put a, a foot on the on the brake, uh, otherwise we'll never get carbon negative. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> um, the single biggest 
problem that we had um, uh, from the moment we switched to biochar, and maybe I'll just give a quick background there. The production of the coal premix, anionic based coal premix, um, we use the same aggregates as the hot premix boys, Los Angeles abrasion, we follow the rules, we, uh, we do uh, uh, Marshall, Marshall design, which do super paved design. Uh, um, initially, all our test work is to volumetric standards, Marshall flow, Marshall stability, indirect tensile strength. So we tick the boxes uh, as the, uh, what I know of, the only coal premix that can be used as a wearing course to the same or better standard as, as hot premix designs. Um, the raw materials is the same aggregates, but we add carbon. Now, traditionally, since the late 90s and early 2000s in Africa, and uh, uh, in the early, I think from 2008 onwards, Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, um, we utilized unwanted coal fines or carbonaceous shales um, because our bonding mechanism is a combination ionic bonds and covalent carbon bonding uh, structures that we develop in the in the cold mix that gives us a penetration bond about two two and a half years ago uh, in malaysia we could not uh, source any uh, uh, repeatable quality quality uh, a product with a repeatable quality uh, on, on the carbon core on, on the uh, coal fine side so we started experimenting with biochar from the uh, coconut industry, activated carbon for the for the for the gold mining industry, and we had good results. And we we did some incinerator uh, ash, etc. Uh, and then we we switched over to the standard biochar that you buy in the hardware store for your potting plants, the horticultural charcoal. Now two years later, we've realised. Um, uh, there is so many different um, discussions and, 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 and uh, ideas around carbon. What is good? What is what is what is not good? Uh, is biochar good? Is it not? Um, so I thought I'll, I'll stick a quick slide in uh, how we see it um, from from biochar. I mean, biochar is a fairly simple explanation up on screen there. Uh, there's many different ways of making biochar now uh, than what there was 10 years ago. Um, but for our purposes, we classify it into these four units, biochar, which uh, that uh, later on in the slides, uh, there's quite detailed discussions on types of biochar and where we would like to go with classification of biochars. Uh, the other side of it is your chars. Um, uh, we have actually, in some of the rural countries, uh, remote and rural countries, we have used charcoal as well when we could not lay our hands on a on a dependable carbon source. Um, the carbon black scenario, we extensively um, uh, uh, used and, and researched in Thailand uh, from about 2016 onwards. Uh, we put up a plant, a cold premix production plant, on a tire tire refinery um, uh, pyrolysis so reactors they they produced uh, uh, bunker bunker oils and obviously very fine graded uh, carbon black as a as a as a byproduct and we we uh, we have quite a lot of or extensive experience incorporating um, these ultra carbon uh, fines carbon black into our product as well. Later on, there is more info on that as well. And then the black carbons, um, the suits and roots and everything from the diesel engines. Uh, I, I am sure that uh, the more clever people on here have uh, much better classifications, but for our purposes, that's how we perceive it at the moment. Uh, next slide, please. There's a bit of a lag, obviously, because I'm a bit further away from you guys. Um, now, this this slide is just a quick uh, interim reference, um, uh, just to to explain where we're coming from and where the carbon and the biochar actually goes in. Um, obviously, there's a, there's a lot more to it, but I'm trying to keep the slides um, uh, to a minimum. Uh, the the left hand side of the screen. 
uh, was actually a feeder road to a quarry uh, in Thailand. Uh, it's about three hours drive north of Bangkok. Um, water tables are very, very low. Um, the temperatures go to up to 40, 41 degrees. Uh, we've measured the temperature of aggregates in, uh, um, in our factory over there. In the shade, um, we've measured them at 37 degrees uh, in, inside the factory. So it's quite a hostile environment. Um, but that's where that specific product there is only half an inch thick. Um, it's a cold premix made with uh, with uh, seven millimeter graded uh, aggregates, a PSD, fairly similar to a Marshall design, um, and uh, um, it contains about four and a half percent carbon black, um, which ranges from a size grading of uh, plus 300 micron minus one millimeter. Um, we we uh, we did not intend to to install in, in uh, it was supposed to be 40 millimeters thick uh, after installation because it's a heavy duty feeder road to a quarry um, but we had to do it in the middle of the night with no equipment manual installation um, and uh, next morning six o'clock they opened the road and the photos that you see there were six months after installation and uh, there's actually videos on YouTube if you Google uh, if you go to YouTube and, and search for uh, Carbon Core Thailand, you should find them. Um, a half, a, half an inch thick, not a single crack, no creeping, no leaching, uh, even in those hot temperatures. And that's when we realized we're onto something. So from there on, we've done quite a, quite a lot of development. Uh, the, uh, the middle bottom section is uh, rural roads in, uh, on, the, on the border between East Malaysia, Sarawak, and, and Kalimantan. Um, the material, was manufactured in our Malaysia Peninsula plant, shipped to East Malaysia, and then in a, we, uh, that specific load we put in a combination of 25 kilo uh, LDPE bags and one ton bulker bags. Uh, in a in an LDPE bag, we have two years shelf life, so we ship to 14 countries uh, from our Malaysian plant. Um, bulker bags, uh, six months plus life. Uh, that was driven by the military up into the middle of nowhere because there's no roads up there and they did the the uh, border uh, military, it's mostly military roads. Uh, we did uh, um, I think about three and a half thousand ton of material there. That material was made with biochar and that contained depending on on uh, aggregate and time of year and various other applications uh, that contain biochar between four and a half percent up to 16 percent of biochar. Um, the uh, uh, the top middle pictures is uh, is a Marshall course. We normally for for our own internal test work we do a 30 millimeter thick uh, Marshall core uh, and uh, uh, we do necessary. Uh, uh, laboratory work on that. Then we came to Australia in 2018 for the first time, went to Darwin, played around, uh, commissioned a plant by July uh, of 2018, a small production plant. And again, in Darwin, there's no, there's no black stuff. So we had to use biochar again. And that's when the real development started. Um, but remote areas, Northern Territories, uh, in the middle of nowhere, and we started playing with soils. Now, all those uh, martial cores that you see there is a mixture of soils from the Tanami Desert, uh, Mount Isa, it's all the Pindans, um, you know, some of the stuff is like talcum powder, and uh, we've basically got to the stage where we can take biochar, or as the, as the uh, hardware stores call it, horticultural charcoal, and uh, mix it with soil, no aggregates, um, add our special emulsion, and we make uh, we make a product that later on, uh, there's more data, we get five-figure uh, MPA resilient modulus uh, performances out of this material. Um, far right, uh, on the bottom right-hand side uh, is... Uh, um, waste uh, reclaimed and waste products from BGC 
uh, here in, in, in Western Australia. It's all it's a con the concrete division. There's uh, concrete slurries, there's uh, crushed bricks, concrete bricks, all the reclaimed uh, bricks. There's uh, the, the slightly off-color version there is, uh, is chipped ceiling board. Here in Australia, everything needs to be recycled. Uh, environmental laws is pretty tough. And then uh, obviously the black stuff is a bit of biochar and we add our our emulsions again to that and uh, we've managed to make quite a range of products utilizing all these wastes again with no additional aggregates coming in. Next slide please. Um, this slide is uh, Main reason for this slide, I mean, this this is a technical discussion on its own with the much more clever people than I'm still a, uh, a teenager when it comes to, to knowledge on biochar. Um, I am sure we can we can schedule sub uh, discussions later on in the week and in the month and to uh, to try and figure out all the all the details around biochar and the types and the processes and what is being used. Um, the the main point on this slide is biochars for specific purposes. Um, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Now, if we look at at uh, uh, current carbon sequestration, because uh, the turn for us came, uh, we made a cold mix product for wedding courses. Um, that uh, developed into quite a substantial business in the world. Uh, then we started adding the emulsions to the soils, and we keep on running up against all the the uh, well-established and influential hot premix guys. It's not easy to break into a market, especially if you are 15, 20% cheaper per square meter installed, um, and uh, uh, being waterproof and all, all other uh, positive uh, uh, properties, which will be discussed later on, uh, it's difficult to break in into the into the into the business. But then came the carbon sequestration side and carbon neutral and carbon negative. So we started uh, incorporating that into our marketing strategy, into our planning strategy, and then also into the research and development side of things. If you look at this slide here, um, I know there's, there's, there's so much information on biochar use for various applications, but the single biggest one that I'm aware of at the moment is still your natural sequestration through carbon, soil carbons, etc. Um, and the work on putting biochar grades into the soil, uh, it, that left-hand picture for me is a... Is a, is a says a lot. Um, biochar or carbon, that's that's soil carbon, is is if if you make a, if you manufacture a bio a, a biochar particle and that binds the carbon up for a thousand four hundred or ten thousand years for that matter. If you put it in a stable environment, but if you it's in the soil there, there's all kinds of things that happen in soils and drainage and water and and the, the earth is a, is a living thing. Um, for us, um, if, you, if you can put the biochar into a construction medium and you can now put it in as a, as a road base or as a wedding course or as low cost housing bricks, um, then you basically exponentially uh, uh, lengthen the time period of which you are sequestrating this carbon for. Especially if you can put it into a medium that becomes waterproof um, um, or contains uh, UV inhibitors, which our products also do, uh, it makes a big difference. If we look at the at the carbon abatement, and there's I've just put one of them up there. It's an Australian one, uh, which is not even relevant anymore, and it's only a year and a half old, I think. Um, the, there's so many so many uh, uh, ideas and models and everything changes every year and people start doing analysis the bottom right hand side there of uh, every country is different what is the effect of uh, GHD um, greenhouse gases on the transport side 
every country is different. Everything is different. So we need to, we need to, if, if we're going to st stay on the theoretical side, um, it's going to be another decade or two before we start doing something. So our goal, uh, next slide please, um, our goal um, was to try and simplify the confusion that's on this slide here. Um, there's uh, from cradle to grave, there's so many different models. Um, and and, and the, the left-hand side one is, is, is fairly simplified. It gives you a picture, but then you look at the right-hand side one, and then it's the what-ifs. What if this and what if that? And, um, you know, what happens for different types of soils, uh, the types, the... Uh, and it... Uh, it, it's it's just not. I, I know we'll get there someday. Human brain is a is a wonderful thing. We'll get there sometime, but it's just so complicated. And then disputed. There's so many people with different ideas, and they don't agree with this, and they don't agree with that. So how do we simplify that? Next slide, please. So this is, I think, quite a fairly old. Uh, um, slide that's, that's I've seen this 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 specific picture around for quite some some years uh, and what Caroline uh, what Kathleen uh, mentioned earlier on is currently biochar or carbon sequestration in whatever form uh, takes place in a very uh, secluded uh, uh, environments and, and, and applications um, and at low concentrations and there's no legislation, and there's very. I think the furthest advance is your medical side of things, uh, where they where they use it as uh, biochar as carriers for medicines and, and time controlled and time released uh, uh, medicines. What is wrong with that picture? There's no construction and pavement. Uh, the amount of biochar that we can get into a road wearing course, uh, just a, a quick. A quick mention, if it's a one kilometer road, two lanes wide, seven and a half meters wide, and we never install more than 30 or 40 millimeters thick. Into a one kilometer two lane road, if we if we put 5% biochar or carbon uh, content into a, into a wading course, we've put 30 tons down. And that's going to stay there for a long time. Now that we, we do soil stabilization for road base, we can go up to 10% of uh, biochar uh, and carbon reclaimed and waste carbons into the soil stabilization side a two kilometer uh, a one kilometer long road seven and a half meters wide two lanes 200 mil thick which is the pretty much the standard here in australia we've got 300 tons of carbon uh, of, of biochar in that road and it's going to stay there for a long time um so this this puts it in a little bit of a different perspective um how long are we going to take before we are allowed to do it? And that's what uh, I have uh, very lucky to have the team, the Liquid Labs and Talos Consulting and, uh, and uh, the university and main roads themselves as well on our side because they're helping us to do it much quicker than what we expected. Next slide, please. So... The uh, it was mentioned a little bit earlier on. Uh, Kathleen again mentioned uh, um, there's a lot of scientific work being done, a lot of R and D, a lot of theoretical work on getting biochars into into asphalt products. Um, the Australian government actually uh, two two and a half years ago um, issued a research and development grant to one of the universities in in Victoria. Uh, and uh, they have been doing uh, quite a lot of work on getting biochar into hot asphalt. Um, they're up at two and a half, three, four percent, I think, by now. Um, but it's obviously uh, with the standards of wearing course applications in, in Australia being a first world country, they have to be very careful. And uh, hot mix, uh, there's certain, certain uh, applications where using biochar as a as an asphalt modifier has uh, has positive uh, 
um, points for hot asphalt, but uh, unfortunately there's more negative than than uh, than positive. Um, the uh, the hot mix uh, normally um, cracking and fatigue resistance. If you put too much uh, crumbly uh, biochar in there, it becomes a real problem. We have already extensively proven, um, and obviously we install everywhere. Um, we get the same uh, positive properties putting biochar into our cold mixes, but additional to that, we have uh, we have now proven massive uh, amounts of um, increases in resilient modulus, tensile modulus, flexural modulus, not only in the wetting courses but also now in the soil stabilization materials. Uh, so that obviously will have a huge effect on on GHD savings. Uh, I think uh, the left hand side of the slide is, talks for itself. Uh, next slide, please. I, sorry, my 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 computer now has a lag. Right. So um, let me just get the right one there. Bye. Uh, sorry, guys. I'm, I've lost my space. Okay, I've got my space. Um, the the single biggest problem we have is the testing regime, as I've mentioned. Um, we've come up with products now that we install that is far superior in performance. Um, it installs quicker, easier to work with. It's obviously much more uh, carbon or environmentally friendly. Um, but how are we going to test? How are we going to tick the boxes um, uh, to be approved to become uh, to become the 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 preferred supplier? That's that's the status we would like to to uh, attain. Um, so we've been going through the through the test work step by step to to. Uh, establish a repeatable performance um, which I think is one of the backbones of of uh, uh, getting this product uh, uh, approved for uses uh, for use throughout various applications and, 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 and um, temperature climates regions territories um, test methods is definitely uh, a, a, a serious uh, issue on our side and uh, we are in the process of putting together a team that can actually fast track um, all these different test methods. Um, next slide please. Now initial test work and thanks again to the team down here in Western Australia. Um, just some indications uh, on the on the right hand side let's tackle that one first uh, was uh, third party not accredited laboratory test the test work done driven by Tullus consulting um, to see what happens with uh, the, the the comparison between your foaming bitumen stabilization practices standard which down here is various behind the contents plus one percent of cement um, they do play around with half a percent and up to two percent as well, but one percent is the standard as far as I know. And we went in directly with uh, again, uh, you'll see the percentages in the bottom uh, on the on the uh, cold emulsion side. Uh, seven percent is actually seven percent emulsion. It's a sixty percent bitumen content emulsion, so it's roughly three and a half percent binder, the same as the FPS on the top. Um, I think the performance figures is, speaks for itself. Um, the single biggest uh, uh, positive result that we see there is the continued uh, integrity of the samples uh, after three days uh, uh, soaked. So the 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 orange the orange columns are are uh, three day cured and the gray ones next to it there's three uh, three days uh, cured soaked um, so that obviously um, I think proves that we have uh, uh, extensive uh, moisture resistance and uh, or resistance against water damages etc 
Uh, the next thing that happened then, on, if you look at the left-hand side, um, is the the uh, flexural modulus uh, uh, again um, uh, with with foaming bitumen stabilization, three and a half percent binder content with half a percent of cement. Um, this uh, is, it's 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 a fifth of what we see utilizing our anionic covalent carbon bonding system together with biochar. That specific, those specific samples had 4% biochar in them. Um, I think there was a there was a bit of a, a, a special try as well. I've seen some of the data where they actually added the, the biochar to the foaming bitumen stabilization uh, application to see if it's the biochar that, that, that's doing this work. And they got, I think, only half the strength. So we are definitely onto something, and, and we are uh, uh, busy fast-tracking this research and development and testing regimes as well. The, the methodology here is with this type of bonding system, with this type of extensive uh, modulus resilient um, flexing, flexural modulus, um, your standard test methods just is not relevant anymore. Um, this we have to go completely performance-based analysis uh, and, uh, and get those test work, test work in, in line so that we can have repeatable results every time. Next slide, please. Now, this is just a quick overview of how our standard production processes work at the moment. Uh, we are we are not up at uh, at major production levels, uh, hot mix levels yet, um, because traditionally we've been producing with uh, as a batch process one and a half ton at a time in a in a planetary paddle mixer. Um, uh, the the advantage of that was that uh, every single batch is the same. Uh, we we pride ourselves we, we prided ourselves in the fact that if you, you can take a 10 kilometer road and you can go and drill a core out of the road after three months, uh, every, every 100 meters, and you don't have to work on an average of 10 analysis uh, like, the, like the hot premix boys. Uh, our cores, each and every one is the same because it was the same cake that was baked every single time. Um, Standard practice, we take the same bitumen as the hot premix guys, uh, um, being at either penetration grade or a viscosity grade. Here in Australia, they exclusively use the viscosity grades. Um, and we receive it at, uh, we receive it at temperature. Uh, we, can, we can emulsify at much lower temperatures than, than the standard uh, emulsions that's being produced in the world now. We, uh, we uh, add our secret herbs and spices. Uh, that forms less than 0.15% of the final product if it's a wedding course material being manufactured. Um, so it's uh, that's obviously made behind closed doors uh, in one place only. We will put up a secondary production site for that uh, for, for various reasons in the near future. But currently that comes out of South Africa, shipped in containers. Um, and uh, uh, we manufacture an emulsion, 60% bitumen, uh, that is stable in most cases without stirring, um, stays stable for up to six months. We can put this in, in drums, IBCs, tanker loads. We, we, uh, we, we can travel quite far and long with these things. Then next step, uh, either on site, uh, for standard production, or in remote areas, we can use little, little small little pug mills or small little planetary mortar mixes. Um, as long as you have a, a PSD that works for the mix design, uh, you uh, you add your aggregates, you add your your uh, biochar or carbon black or wrap the the. Re Reclaimed asphalt products. We 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 make uh, we make roads utilize uh, using up to 80% wrap, and they still pass all the volumetric tests that's done on them. But aggregates in, 
um, biochar in, dry mix for 20 seconds at roughly 10% emulsion. Uh, we, we, uh, our binders normally range between 5.3 and 5.8% of the final product. And uh, you wet mix for 20 seconds and you kick it out the gate. Uh, that goes either into 25 kilo bags, we ship them all over as far as Nepal, Myanmar, we install roads everywhere. Or we stick them into one ton bulk of bags from our Darwin facility we currently supply as far away as Townsville and, and Mount Isa and Alice Springs. Or it goes as loose bulk on, on the back of a tipper lorry and you can travel for two weeks as long as you keep water off it, uh, covered it with a tarpaulin and you go. Um, uh, next slide, please. Now, after this slide, there's a, there's a lot of uh, um, photos, applications before we get to some more technical stuff again. Uh, this one is just a straightforward uh, marketing slide. Um, there's no creeping, no cracking, no heat, no leaching, no solvents, no tack coats. We install straight onto damp compacted soils uh, as a road base in Africa. Um, obviously for proper high-speed roads and, and airports we, we need to do the base designs properly. The reason why, just very quickly, um, no cracking uh, is if we can get enough carbon in there, it, uh, the more carbon that's in there the more flexible it becomes uh, and I think all the, all the modulus uh, test work that's been done lately has proven that. Um, Creeping, uh, we say no creeping, uh, obviously the base needs to be stable. In our case, the base normally stays stable because our material containing so much uh, anti-wetting carbon in there, um, the surface becomes uh, waterproof. Um, because there's no solvents and heat involved in the, in the actual product mixing process, we can get UV inhibitors in there, suntan lotion, uh, we, we uh, we don't have the surface layer bitumen oxidation problem, so there's no micro cracking, which is normally in, in this type of environment, your top down cracking is your mode of failure. Um, because we contain carbon, uh, and in hot countries we, we, we stick more in, uh, because carbon conducts heat. Uh, so you'll, we, we, we experience up to 10 degrees in, in, in very high hot climate environments with high traffic loads. Um, we, uh, like the elevated motorways in, in Bangkok, um, we experience up to 10 degrees lower temperature, surface temperatures on the roads. And that obviously bitumen does not like temperature. Um, we don't use tack coats because we have a penetration bond. I'll show some slides now. Uh, no waste because what's not used or if there's suddenly a rainstorm or a thunderstorm, uh, you stop installing and when it's finished, uh, the surface just gets damp compacted again and you carry on with installation. We even manage to install in light rainy conditions um, because during installation we do add a little bit of water to, uh, to kick off the, the emulsion breaking process. Uh, next slide, please. So few slides just to show what we do um, on the this is Myanmar this is about 400 kilometers south of Yangon uh, up against the Thailand border um, there is no there is no uh, aggregates in that whole area they, um, they, they there's no there's no quarry quarries uh, transport the roads are in general not not serviceable for heavy duty traffic. So what these guys have done is they've over the years uh, um, collected some dump rock and they've built a little bit of a road shoulder with that and they filled that in with a clay, clay is uh, high clay content soil, which they dug up from somewhere. It's all flatlands and, and marshlands and rice paddies. And um, so we went there we uh, we put down a, a few guidelines, uh, wooden wooden uh, beams. Uh, you'll see the outer edge one is slightly thicker than the inner edge because from Africa we we've realised that they always build the roads and it's not a full a full two lanes because they they save. So people go on off on off uh, when they pass each other. So we beef up the road shoulder a little bit. Uh, 
the bags, uh, those 25 kilo bags, were shipped from our Malaysian plant to Yangon and then driven down back again 400 kilometers on on little lorries. Uh, manual installation, excuse the fact that there's no PPE. Uh, they, they they must still they must uh, they must still learn how to do that like we have to do here in Australia now. Um, it's easy to work with the material. It's uh, it's moist but it's not sticky. You can walk on it. Um, if you if you get it on your hands, uh, if you if you if your hands are moist, then immediately you you'll get the emulsion breaking and that's bitumen. Then you need a solvent to clean yourself. Um, but as long as you keep the equipment dry while you are working, it's easy to spread out. Um, and the only compactor, normally we only require lightweight compaction equipment because um, the maximum thickness of installation is 40 mil compacted down to 30 if it's on a, on a soil-based uh, uh, road base. Um, so the same machine that damp compacted the surface uh, gave it two or three runs. And on the bottom right, there's a, it's a bit dark, the picture, but there's a little truck there. That road is 30 minutes old. So for lightweight traffic in a straight line, we can open the roads within 30 minutes if the weather is fairly summer. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now this is one of the more, um, this is Yemen, and that's what's before the big war started. This was in 2015 or 2016, somewhere around there. Um, we've supplied quite a lot of material there. Um, it was a bomb blast. Uh, they had to fix, that's their main road in, in Yemen, in, uh, I forget the name of the town now, uh, the city now. Um, but we went in there, um, they, uh, on that specific stretch, they actually um, prepared the base for a 60 millimeter installation because that's what they normally do in, in, in hot premix. So in that case, we went and we put in two two layers. We put in 40 down to uh, compact down to 30, and then about 15 minutes later, we did another another one on top. But that's not the norm. Uh, the center, the photo in the middle center bottom, um, that's the road the next day. So that's the, the carbon core surface. Uh, it, in Yemen, it cured exceptionally fast. Um, next slide, please. So uh, easy to install in difficult environments. Um, this one is just uh, more photos uh, I mentioned before on the, on the border between East Malaysia and Kalimantan. It's for the military. Um, a note on the equipment. Uh, we use the same paving machines, no modifications needed. Uh, the only difference is heat switch is off. We do not require any heat. We have uh, experimented a little bit by putting a, a medium, a low heat uh, application in on, on, the, on the paving machine for colder countries so that we get a little bit quicker curing. So we are busy putting together a method statement for that as well. But in general, we install no heat. The, a uh, big significance here is with one uh, paving machine and one compactor and one team, we can do up to four kilometers of road in a day uh, compared to in those environments with the same uh, with the same uh, equipment and people. They, they get to 500 meters a day if they do hot premix. So we do tend to, to get the job done a, a lot quicker. Um, if it's a fairly that that's an existing road used by the military. So the base was actually in a very good condition. We just profiled it a bit, damped it and compacted it and went straight onto that. If it's, uh, if it's that type of environment, we do not even use roller compaction, vibration compaction rollers. We just use the tire profiler, and the, as you see in the bottom right. Uh, and those little white dots there, that's water sprayed. Once you've, once you've uh, put the material down, either by hand or by paving machine. The moment you add a little bit of water to it, uh, it uh, kicks off the breaking mechanism in the, in the emulsion, the bitumen bombs out, the water evaporates, and you have a road. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the left-hand side, the two pictures on the left-hand side, 
is Africa, um, one of my favorites, at least they're wearing some PPE. And uh, uh, there you can see that we, that was a, that was a, a whole road to a mine, which was about 87 kilometers long in Cameroon. Um, and again, there the material goes straight onto a damp compacted surface. Um, unfortunately, there's not enough space for all the photos, but uh, we also used uh, the carbon core material to uh, to line the the stormwater drains next to the roads, so that you have um, water runoff, proper water runoff, so that you're protecting the base. The center picture uh, was actually our qualification trial in Malaysia. We did one kilometer of road, four lanes wide. Uh, that is a 20 millimeter um, uh, wearing course uh, overlay, as you guys should say, yeah? overlay material. So that was that was 25 millimeter uh, installed with a tamper setting on the on the paving machine and compacted down to 20. And we did that in direct comparison with hot remix at 50 mol thick. And after after one year and four months of monitoring this road, uh, we got full endorsement in Malaysia um, for this material. The, the, the bottom picture, the small little one out there, is uh, repair works we did on the airport in Nepal, in Kathmandu. Um, again, it's a quick fix for if you have unwanted uh, earthquakes. Right hand side, top right hand side, all the coastal roads in Timor Leste. Um, uh, being installed with our material again straight onto the existing coastal roads. Uh, bottom right is actually the landing strip, the landing section of the airport in, in Mozambique, Maputo. Yeah, at that stage, uh, or the, the, they don't they don't land three A380s there, but I think they go up to the they do do white bodies up to uh, the seventh. 737s or 767s, I think is the biggest that they land there. Next slide, please. Uh, while the slides are changing, we do not have airport accreditation anywhere in the world. Uh, people use the product on their own accord. We've not, we, we haven't had the time or experience yet to go to the level of uh, getting our materials approved for the airport. But unofficially, if you land on some of the big airports in Asia, you, you land on our material because it's just cost effective and easy and it lasts so much longer. Um, this one is close-ups of the road in Thailand, uh, the feeder road. Um, after we drilled out the first core and realized the road is only half an inch thick and it was supposed to be 30 more, then uh, we drilled quite a many more. Um, uh, again, these, the, the videos are on YouTube, so you can go and look for yourself, see for yourself. The right-hand side photo shows um, the, that that uh, little puck came out the hole, and you can see even after the vigorous drilling, uh, getting it out, um, the uh, base. There's the, you can see the, the effect of uh, of penetration into the base, which helps a lot with stopping creeping and all kinds of things that normally go wrong with these roads. Um, next slide, please. This is, uh, I think this was the launch for us in Western Australia. We, we, we got our production plant going in, in, uh, in Northern Territories in Darwin, and then we backhauled 4,000 or 4,500 kilometers. We backhauled some material down to Adelaide in South Australia. And we installed there in, uh, I think it was uh, November of 2018. And nine months later, the Department of Transport and Industry, um, which is the, their main road equivalent, they endorsed our material fully. Uh, and again, that was there's some case studies again on our website that you can find, um, where they gave us the most difficult roads to install and uh, uh, overlays on crocodile crack uh, compromised base. Um, but after nine months, they could not believe it, and we got full endorsement. Came to Western Australia. Australia is so big, every state is like a different world. 
So what goes in Adelaide or in North Northern Territories does not work for Western Australia, so we start all over. When we arrived here, um, they've just completed a quite a long, I think it's 20 plus kilometer motorway section, and they call it North Link 2, um, which is on the bottom right-hand corner. You can see on the left-hand side, you can see just barely make out some of the cars on the, on the motorway. But in Australia, every motorway gets a PSP. It's a footpath and it's orange, must be red. They do some chroma, chroma uh, I use iron oxide, I think about one and a half to two and a half percent of iron oxide to to get their, their hot mixes uh, the right color. And they do this with for all the footpaths, bicycle paths, jogging paths, uh, uh, wheelchairs, and then also for all the bus lanes. Now, after they installed this, they realized something went wrong somewhere, and 21 kilometers of this uh, of this footpath had more than a 25 millimeter drop off, which is dangerous for bicycles and wheelchairs. But all the fences were up, um, and uh, they had a bit of a problem on edging it. Um, so we we were approached by main roads or by the contract main contractors to develop if see if we have a solution so long story short we took naturally graded seven millimeter graded uh, laterite and yes we had to add a little bit of uh, of oxide but we only we got away with uh, i think 0.3 or 0.4 percent of oxide versus 1.5 that they normally use they did force us to put some five millimeter um, granite in there that's the gray stuff uh, now we don't use it anymore, but at that stage we didn't have a choice because that was part of the mixed designs and and testing regimes and, and everything uh, of products used up until then. Um, we uh, just obviously did it in a quick quickly in a Chinese walk, made up the initial material, and we went and did a demo installation, uh, did the necessary test work on the Marshall cores and passed with flying colors and since then uh, we we've taken uh, um, Ryan Ryan Grief is instrumental in that we've taken a, a, a concrete curving machine we modified the mix so that you can actually pump it and uh, and we etched 21 kilometers both sides of these roads uh, and now after inspection the quality is so good it's cold mix the quality is so good that they want to use it for the bus lanes now. So we slowly but surely getting there. Again, you see the black little hip there, biochar. There's biochar in, uh, and again, at that stage of the game, we used, I think, three or 4% biochar. Now we can get bigger quantities in. Our material needs a minimum specific amount, depending on, on, the, on the carbon source. It needs a minimum specific amount of carbon uh, uh, technically to to have the superior bonding system but we have found that by putting in more we we observe all kinds of other uh, uh, performance based benefits and obviously water resistance etc next slide please I hope I'm not talking to myself <laughs> okay uh, I think we're getting close to the end. Um, this one again uh, was a bit bored one day. Started playing with different colors. Uh, the bottom left-hand one is actually a a chroma color, a red oxide equivalent color, but that was made not utilizing any oxides. That was made with uh, a new invention, uh, environmentally friendly coloring uh, agent. Um, obviously green. Uh, standard black on the left hand side and again started adding all these type of things to soils and there you can see Marshall cores curing in the oven for test work um, and again all of that contains uh, minimum three or four percent biochar. Next slide please. This was uh, our first big in, in installation in Australia, the one I mentioned down in uh, for DPTI in uh, South Australia on the right hand, top right hand side. Oh no, sorry, it's a mixture of a few. The top left hand side was 
was the DPTI installation. The two bottom slides were actually installation on a wine farm. There's a big problem in many wine areas in Australia at the moment because they've been putting they've been putting a imported uh, uh, granular material onto these roads that contains high silica content. So there's actually at this moment in time a big worry about silicosis and lung related uh, um, health problems um, and I think uh, initially we started putting the standard uh, uh, wearing coarse material, cold mix material onto the roads. Nowadays people they want naturally colored roads and we can now do soil colored roads or actually using their existing soils and giving them a road that is more than good enough for their type of traffic. Um, next slide please. Then we came to fairly recent um, doing large-scale soil stabilization for as a road base. Um, I've put these pictures in. We're still in development stage with this, uh, but I think we are we are very close to implementing it full full bore now. Um, what you can see there is the left-hand side. Uh, if you look at the bottom right-hand picture, um, the left-hand part of the road, it's a two and two and a half, three, I think it's about a three-lane wide road. Um, the uh, left-hand side is fairly light in color. That's the standard farming bitumen application with 1% cement. And on the right-hand side, um, you can see the, the coloring in there which is mainly due to uh, to the biochar. Um, in these type of applications now, we can get in as high as 10% biochar. Um, we're still pushing the limits, see how far we can go, but that is research and development ongoing at the moment. Um, next slide, please. That's just a quick, uh, that was one of the initial initial uh, test works that we've done, uh, resilient modulus um, and uh, obviously soil, soil dependent and also binder content. We can, we, if we, we can, if we range around to anything from one and a half to three, three, three and a half percent binder content um, uh, in the soil together with a, a four percent, three or four percent biochar content, we get we get resilient modulus ranging from 3,000 up to 5,000. Uh, the bottom right-hand little pug, I call that the mystery mix. Um, that, that's one where we did a, a, special, a special design on it and uh, we pushed the actual binder content up to 7%. So it becomes a little bit more expensive, but you can see there's, a, there's an indentation on the, on the core that's already been tested. Normally when these uh, uh, martial cores are tested under these environments, they shatter, they break, they, it's dust everywhere by the time they go. Um, this one gave a slight bump, you can see a crack through the little M there. Um, and uh, this one tested at more than 10,000 of MPA on resilient modulus. So again, this is uh, an option to take, an, 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 and the soil came from the Tanami Desert Road in the middle of Australia. Um, there's, uh, there's opportunities to uh, utilize uh, in situ soils and do lightweight uh, aircraft runways, uh, maybe too, too difficult to get to the roads. And of course, dust suppression is a major health issue as well. Uh, I think there's the last slide coming up, and then I'll keep my mouth shut and the people ask questions. <laughs> um, current uh, developments in uh, uh, in place in, in, in the R&D lab. Uh, top left hand side we've uh, taken biochar, it's a bit dark to see but the small little canister there is multicultural charcoal, biochar. Um, it was uh, developed at a fairly, fairly high temperature, I think that's about a, a 700 degree temperature. Um, we infused that biochar with a special blend of our emulsion, uh, which is the right-hand little bucket. 
and then after after a week or so of curing, uh, or it, it's still a little bit moist, but we've we've managed to 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 keep the binder uh, the bulk of the binder content in that uh, granular environment. We've managed to keep it alive, and we took uh, roughly eight percent by weight of the infused biochar. We added that to a pinned down soil and uh, give it a bit of a mix and added water. Uh, give it another mix and then we compact it and that's the Marshall core you see on the left hand side there. Now that you can you can throw it around the room. I have done so you can see there's a little bit of damage on the edges but uh, we are in process of uh, developing a, a regime of how much of what to attain what sort of strengths but that is definitely a future uh, uh, a product or as you you can ship a semi-dry or granular product to the middle of nowhere mix it with your soils compact it and uh, you have a hot stand area a road uh, so that's that's development in progress right hand side that is a mixture of uh, the, the 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 far right uh, pug is a is a, a road base concrete wastes uh, together with high quantities of biochar plus some glass fines plus rubber. There's 8% uh, uh, crumb rubber at uh, 30 mesh size in there. Um, the left hand pug is a blend of 50 50 baghouse filter fines uh, and rubber fines. It's very lightweight, density is just over 600, I think. Um, with a bit of biochar in there, and again, it's a, it's actually a, 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 a um, an emulsion mix that contains uh, uh, biochar fines, a special grade of fines uh, in there. Um, lightweight concrete. It it, uh, it it's very very light. Um, it's got uh, I've immersed it in, at temperature in a water bath for seven days. Uh, only 0.4 percent. Uh, moisture uptake and uh, it cures back to where it came from so there's a lot of options for lightweight uh, building blocks um, um, curbing stormwater drains uh, slope stabilization there's a lot of options there and then the bottom the bottom lot is again bored a little bit start playing around with colors uh, taking Desert soils and then topping them with 100% waterproof resistant. Uh, uh, that's a polymer combination. The one of them, the other one is I've taken up to 20% rubber fines and emulsified that back into the emulsion. So now it's not a it's not a it's not a granular or a particle distribution, a rubber distribution through the emulsion. It's actually emulsified into the emulsion as part of it. And uh, with that, that's on the left-hand side, and then doing some different color versions on that, and working towards uh, being able to to utilize bitumen and rubber, and get that to be fuel resistant. Um, we've already done some trials, um, and uh, so far only about five weeks into the trials now, but it's looking extremely promising. To be able to to get uh, and of, of course there is a, a complement of um, biochar fines in that liquid as well so it's a combination uh, anionic emulsion 20% rubber and uh, depending on on size grading we get up to two or three percent biochar in there as well so that's my story um, I don't know I did not keep an eye on the time. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of technical information which I've not included on the uh, on the uh, presentation, but I down the line still tonight and further next week, week after, we are open to to uh, to get involved in all the exciting things to clean up Mother Earth. Thank you so much, Andre. That was really really interesting, and and we appreciate your sharing your experience and enthusiasm. I was all ready to say to the listeners, uh, ask if they could keep their questions focused on the subject. 
because oftentimes on these webinars, we get all sorts of questions, but I have to say they're all very focused on the use of biochar and asphalt. And we already have so many questions. I, I know we're not gonna get to all of them, but I'm gonna try to lump some of them together, the ones that I think are really the most critical. Uh, and the first one is really about the economics of this. And I know you and I have talked about this, but everybody wants to know how much you're paying for the biochar, how does it make sense economically compared to current road building practices? So if you could address that. Yeah, I think I'll, 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 I'll keep it, try and keep it to two minutes. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of discussions around this. Um, biochar uh, in different parts of the world, different costs. I mean, here are some biochar, some people are selling biochars for $900 a ton. Some are selling it for $300, $250 a ton. One of the things that we have to do, and Craig Bucknell is, is also on, on uh, he can perhaps also later chip in. Um, we have to, number one, develop a classification system, because if you're going to have a, a, a charring facility that, that makes the same product every day in and out, uh, that's going to be difficult, because uh, cost-wise, commercially, uh, unless you get subsidized by the government, it's going to be difficult but we've discussed this and we've done some costing models and if you have a facility that can make a range of different types of biochars you can take low temperature graded biochars which is normally good for for your organics uh, your inorganics um you know the the the, the absorption ability or absorb, uh, absorption ability of biochar for your heavy metals is astronomical so there's contaminated soils that can be treated very easily with a low temperature biochar the higher temperature ones, um, uh, your organic uptakes, uh, uh, that's where you can infuse it with fertilizers. You've got your medical grade biochars. If we can get a range of different biochars, feedstocks and combinations thereof, it is very easy to actually get to a, a commercially, commercially viable um, scenario because you can sell massive amounts of quick quick made biochar for for road construction industry uh, and you can sell the the slightly higher graded ones take a bit of longer time etc for agricultural so there is a way and mean um, our single biggest advantage is if we compare ourselves uh, on, on on a road wearing course uh, hot premix needs to be 50 60 millimeters in some countries minimum 70 millimeters thick we do exactly the same job with 30 millimeters of uh, um, wearing course. Obviously, we, we, we have some technology in there, so per ton or per cubic meter, our material is, is, is slightly more, 15, 20% more expensive than hot premix, but we use less than half the amount. Now, for that reason, we can actually include a raw material being one of biochar being one of them. We can include a high cost raw material into the road system. It gives us brownie points. It gives us carbon credits. Uh, we now have mining organizations asking us, please put enough biochar in so that you are carbon negative because we need the carbon credits. Otherwise, we can't expand with the next day. So there is, there is a way, there is a mean. Um, and it can be done. If we are all just a little bit positive, we can install wedding course construction materials cheaper per square meter and still get a lot of biochar uh, in there, even if the biochar is at higher cost. So, Andre, maybe you could talk a little bit more about the, the different types of biochar you've already used, what you're thinking about in the future. There are a lot of questions about, you know, what's the carbon content, what's the feedstock, what's the particle size. I, I know you don't want to give all of that away, but if you could talk a little bit about what you've experienced so far. Yeah, in general, we've used biochars from zero to, to 10 millimeters, um, depending on what you do with it. The, the the mean grades that we normally do is a is a sub 6.7 millimeter. Um, we some we've used biochars from uh, from quite a lot uh, different types of feedstocks. The single biggest uh, threat at this moment in time is that somebody goes and they chop down a rainforest to make biochar so that they can sell it to you and make money. So. Number one, we have to make sure that there's some sort of a control mechanism in place to make sure that we use the the correct feedstocks. Number one, um, we've we've used. I mean, we, uh, I'm 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 happy to uh, later on 
uh, later in the week or next week, uh, have a separate discussion on the types of biochar. Obviously, certain certain information we'd like to sign up uh, non-disclosure agreements with uh, interested parties first before we we uh, give away too much information. But in many cases, we've we've taken uh, biochar and we've grinded and graded it and uh, we've 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 uh, beneficiated it to sort our own internal processes and products as well so but uh, uh, from for, from the carbon or from the cold mix uh, uh, point of view we can use any carbon source so okay so I think what one of the questions was on the, have you noticed any difference between biochar made through gasification or pyrolysis or even something like hydrothermal carbonization we have seen minor differences but uh, uh at this stage of the game i've i've uh, and, and i'll be talking to uh, professor chow about this soon as well uh, i think the classification or the, or the 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 r and d work to to try to try and determine what the influences of different types of carbon is, is not relevant at this stage of the game, purely because of the fact that we're five times stronger, uh, you know, than anything else currently being in use. So, mm -hmm. yes, it needs to be done. We've not started that work yet, but there is minor differences, not major. Um, we can handle high sulfur contents, we can handle high ash contents, we can handle high nitrogen contents. The beauty of our stuff is if the biochar and or soil medium that you mix it with, if that is contaminated with with heavy metals or, or, or PFAS, your, your fire fireproofing stuff, um, et cetera, um, our emulsion, the moment you add it in there with enough biochar, you make the mass inert. You make it waterproof. Mm -hmm. So you lock in whatever nasties are there. So if you can get that... Uh, um, specifications uh, approved by governments. Uh, I mean, we can we can really now start cleaning up the earth, not only by sequestrating, but also cleaning up your ground groundwater systems. So there's endless possibilities. But yes, there is influences, but it's not enough at this moment in time to worry us because we are so much better than anything else. <laughs> Okay, uh, a lot of questions, uh, and I know I've asked you this myself because I live in upstate New York, but has this been tested in cold climates that have a freeze frost um, every year? We we initially, uh, that's one of the first things we did um, is to, uh, to go, uh, we went down to minus 45. And we, we theoretically, uh, in, on, 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 on laboratory scale and freezing the stuff in, in quick freezes and doing all kinds of stuff, our wedding course material stays volume stable from minus 45 up to about uh, 82, 85, depending on the grade of bitumen used. Um, we have seen, obviously, in South Africa, we've done installations up in the mountains where it gets topped with snow and, and ice in the winter. Um, we have a, a much, much better resistance against your uh, freeze thaw cycles, purely because of the fact that it's waterproof. Um, if water can't get in, it can't do damage. Um, so we've we've done some minor installations in Norway, uh, and we've actually air freighted some material out to Illinois about five, six years ago, and they did some pothole maintenance on one of your motorways there in the middle of the winter, and three years later the they were very happy, but uh, we've not we've not had the time uh, to to get to America yet. But we will be there soon. Well, I can tell you there are a lot of people that would offer an invitation, including I see my friend Gerald Dunst is wondering when you'll be able to go to Austria. <laughs> so I, <laughs> all I can yeah, say is I uh, invited them first. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, hi, Gerald. Uh, sorry if it wasn't for the COVID, I think we would have been there already in your beautiful town. Um, but we'll get there soon. Um, yeah, one, one, one uh, uh, additional comment on that. Uh, one of the biggest modes of failures uh, for road maintenance and repair is when you, it doesn't matter what the weather is like, hot or cold, but it's more severe in cold climates, is when you do a repair, your bonding mechanism with the sidewall always leaves a micro crack, which gets bigger, uh, water gets in, uh, vibration, uh, it, it opens up the crack and uh, 
you start losing your base. Uh, the, the, the pot or base becomes unstable. With our technology, um, we have a waterproof and flexible bonding mechanism, not only to the substrate, but also to the side walls of any material. Our material bonds to steel, it bonds to concrete. In, in Vietnam, we're doing all the steel bridges directly. Our coal premix goes directly onto the steel surfaces of the suspension bridges, and we've cut the the accident rates, uh, death rates, down by 80%, um, because when the steel gets wet, they don't slip and slide with their motorbikes. So there's 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 a lot of there's a lot of positives, but you know, an hour is not long enough. <laughs> um, Andre, had you thought through the kind of end of life uh, for this material? Uh, one of the listeners said, you know, an average road may last 20 years. What what happens to the biochar that's part of this mix in that scenario? Well, again, um, in most modern uh, societies, uh, roads are designed for a specific time period. It might be 10 years, might be 15, it might be 20, or even longer in certain cases if it's the cement-based roads. Uh, and there's always a planned maintenance to go and resurface. Um, we have found, and again, we are teenagers in this field because our oldest road was installed in 2000. Our, we've done bottle maintenance repair up to 2005, but from 2006 onwards in Africa, we started installing uh, proper roads, um, new roads and resurfacing of existing roads. Our oldest road is 2000, it was still done in 2006. The next oldest really large-scale road was done in 2010. So, you know, most of our roads are 10 years old. Uh, life of, you know, end of life, what do you do with it? Uh, we have found that um, even the old roads that we went back to uh, with, with the first generation and second generation technology, they're still there. Um, no maintenance done uh, or needed. Um, if, you have, if you have nominal wearing, um, we, we have the ability to utilize a 6.7 millimeter graded um, uh, aggregate and we can go and stick a 10 millimeter uh, resurfacing on any existing road and you and basically you just keep the, the top you know, the, the level of the road where it's supposed to be. So there's no milling required. So you know our feeling is you just keep on topping you know every 15, 20 years you'd put another 10 or 15 mil on top. So you're not going to take it out. Mm. We don't know. That's 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 you know that in theory, the the biochar that's in there. Um, uh, maybe one thing I didn't mention earlier. Um, we have also found um, that by utilizing a certain grade of biochar and a certain size grading, we have self-healing properties in the roads because some of the some of the emulsion inside the biochar stays alive for years. Um, we have, I mean, um, so if you have damage, it obviously cracks up uh, some of the biochar particles and it releases some binder and it bonds back in. So it's a fix-it-yourself road. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a dream for, for most road builders, but we see it every day. That actually leads into a question that just came up about whether this can withstand tires that have studs on them, like they use in northern climates. Well, that's the, that's the, and I think uh, Colin, Colin uh, Leak or maybe even Ryan Greaves can answer this question much better than me, because they've they, they've been they've been doing the real hardcore testing of the stuff in the labs. But we develop massive amounts of exponentially stronger uh, crushing strengths, but. The material still stays flexible. Now, for the military, as I've mentioned, uh, the, one of the main reasons the military in, in, in Malaysia and Singapore and Thailand and Vietnam uses our material is they can drive with their, their war tanks, their, their, their steel tracked vehicles. They can drive on it um, and there's scuff marks, but it, it doesn't break up. If they do that on any of the asphalt roads, I mean, they have to resurface. If they do that on their concrete roads, they don't last long. They start cracking and falling apart. So, again, we are teenagers. We are 10 years old, effectively. 
So I'm going to try to get to three more questions, but uh, I'm wondering, Caroline, if we can capture all these questions and the ones that haven't been answered, if we could send them to Andre and maybe he'd be willing to answer a few more uh, in writing and then we could share that with the, the folks that registered. Is that possible? Yeah, well, if you, that's yeah, definitely if you, possible. Uh, or they're welcome to, to send through questions by email as well. And I will, when I reply back, I can always copy you know, a, a fixed email in on that side so that it can be forwarded to the rest of the participants if they're interested. So I'm still, I'm well, still there's, fine. There's, Even though it's late here, I can go for another hour or so if people want to go on. <laughs> no problem. I, I am passionate about this. And I, I think what we may end up doing here, Andre, is <laughs> a longer kind of half-day seminar with you and some of the researchers uh, so that people could go into a little bit more depth than we've been able to go into today. Um, so let me just give you a couple of quick questions. There was a really interesting comment about, you mentioned that uh, these roads that include biochar conduct heat such that they, they are um, lower temperature. In many other situations, we've seen that biochar is an insulator. So they just wanted you to clarify what you, you meant there. Well, I mean, in general, carbon uh, conducts heat and electricity for that matter. Um, with And again, this is proprietary information, but with what we do in there, we do find that with enough, even with, with biochar, with, 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 a, with a suitably enough quantity of biochar in the mix, i.e. the total carbon content goes past a certain limit, we can actually start measuring a resistance. You know, we can re re measure an ohm. Uh, across it, um, which it's it's early stages, but I'll I'll mention it because it is a passion. Uh, we are looking at uh, at uh, utilizing certain carbon bonding mechanisms in the mix so that you can actually get it to light up in the middle of the dark. We've done that actually in lab scale, but that's that's you know that needs another that needs a million or two. You know that needs a bit of money to take it to the next level. Um, yeah. But you know, the, one of one of biochar's futures is uh, it's it's going to be the it's going to be the new battery contents. You know, your yeah. your um, so so biochar depends on how you pack them, how you rack them, how you stack them. Uh, it's a, it's an easy material to work with. If you if you if you give it enough pressure and heat, then you make a diamond. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, okay. Uh, just two quick more questions. Uh, there was a question about what in this situation the biochar is displacing. And, and there's been some questions about, you know, is this carbon black? Because some of the pictures talked about black carbon, carbon black, and char. So if you if you have a minute or so to just clarify that. Yeah, I can I can mean I mean that this says again the biochar is actually not replacing anything. Um, it is uh, it's a bonding mechanism. Um, uh, we need carbon. We can get that carbon from anything. Uh, obviously, if we use biochar, then it, then, then it makes us so much more environmentally friendly and it puts us to the first of the queue as a preferred supplier. Um, the biochar together with our proprietary um, uh, emulsification and stabilization systems that we use, uh, I call it the herbs and, uh, the herbs and spices, um, and again, it's, it's a mixture of rosins and resins and, and, and waxes and there's 14 ingredients in there and we can obviously tell people what it is, but then we have to lock them up for the rest of their lives. Um, the, uh, we create, we utilize certain uh, rosin systems to create a covalent carbon bond between bitumen aggregates, uh, et cetera, whereby current uh, uh, hot bitumen based practices uh, is totally dependable on ionic bonding systems um, and cohesion bonding systems, which is weak bonds. So it's not really replacing anything. It actually becomes the, the, the glue in between uh, all the different things uh, to keep them stronger, but more flexible. So that's a layman's, I mean, obviously, technically, there's a much better. Yeah. Okay, we, and last we question. Wanna, we don't want to give away too much. <laughs> Thank you. 
the last question I wanted to just highlight is from uh, probably a friend of yours down there in Australia, Kathy Dawson, wanted to know if you could talk briefly about some of the other applications such as dam leakage repair, that sort of thing. Where else do you see this going? Yes, um, the, one of the single biggest uh, requests that we've had since uh, early 18, uh, since early, uh, early 2018, um, the the farming and cattle cattle industries here they have they have big problems with uh, sealing of their dams, um, and uh, the first thing that they wanted to do because we claim that we are waterproof, yeah, we are waterproof, but it's still a bitumen based bond or still a bitumen based binder um, and with the oxidation especially in the high brine and high salt content areas in Australia that is always a problem for, for, for bitumen. Uh, I have now our, our next generation that we will be releasing soon is a non-ionic um, bonding mechanism um, and the advantage with that is that we can combine that with polymers uh, your anionic uh, at this stage, there's no way to, to combine the anionic with uh, with a with a polymer-based technology, but the ion, the non-ionic can, and we have done it, and that can be applied as sealants for dam. It's even I'm even working on a sedimentation-type technology whereby we, we combine um, biochar with non-ionic polymerized uh, sludge. And it sediments to the bottom, and it's a plug. It's a plug sealer. So yes, that is coming, but uh, um, it's uh, it needs a bit more work. But it's the, the initial results is very very positive. That's excellent. Well, I think we're going to have to wrap up. We're a few minutes over, and I have a couple more slides that I wanted to wrap up. But thanks again, Andre. I know it's it's getting quite late there, and we really appreciate all the time you put into this. So no, I just. No, I think yeah, thanks a lot. But I mean, afterwards, if they if they want to ask some more questions, then fine. I yeah, I think we may end up uh, having a follow up a little bit longer, a discussion on this. Um, okay. Yeah. But uh, thank you, everybody. Um, we do have a few upcoming webinars that I hope might be of interest to some of you. Uh, the next one will be on June 9th. You can learn about the first ever blockchain carbon removal marketplace that traces biochar from the biomass acquisition phase to the final resting place. Uh, and the folks from Carbon Future will explain how their new marketplace will work and how you can get involved. And then we have our first ever uh, sponsored webinar, which will be talking about the production and use of biochar on dairy farms. We give thanks to the Innovation Center for US Dairy for providing funding for the development of a white paper and for this webinar, which will enable it to be free for everybody. And then in July, we're planning to host our first ever investor forum to introduce the growing number of investors to the biochar industry. Next slide. Uh, for any non-members that joined us today, we would love to have you become IBI members. And to encourage that, we have this little special offer, which you can read about here. After this, you should receive a short survey related to today's webinar. Filling that out really helps us to uh, continue to improve our webinar series and to plan for future topics. So I'd like to thank everybody again for tuning in today and for your continued support of IBI. Stay safe, and I hope to have you join us again in the future. Thanks, Kathleen. Thanks, Andre. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, uh, send emails. And I'm here. That's great. Thank you. Thanks.